Hi there, it's great to have you with me again on the Sports Stories podcast. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Dave Levine, and today's show is episode number 17. Our last show had a football theme, and today we will move towards cricket. I'm delighted to have John Stanworth with me today, as he has enormous amount of experience and insight into cricket, performance environments, and talent development. John also likes to tell a few stories along the way. I'm confident you will both be entertained and, as importantly, take something to help you along your way. John is a true people developer and has many successes to prove it. So let's get on with today's show and let me introduce the current head coach for the England Women's Academy and former Lancashire Cricket Academy Director with 35 years experience in the game, Mr John Stanworth. John, really great to have you on the Sports Stories podcast today. I'm going to call you Stanny because that's the way that I know you and um, most people do know you. So I, I hope that's OK. Before we really get into the the, the meat of the, the podcast, I, I really like my guests to uh, understand who you are and understand a little bit about my uh, guest. Could you give us a, a bit of an insight and introduce yourself? Yeah, I, I'm currently the head coach of the England Women's Cricket Academy. Um, it's a it's a, a long garbled uh, title, which you couldn't fit on your back. Um, but it, it sort of mirrors what I did for for 14 years uh, in the men's game at, at Lancashire, and 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 I've spent probably you now 35 years working in professional sport and professional cricket, um, with the, with the odd uh, a year and a bit working for myself. But primarily, that's been my main source of work and um, and income. Okay, Stanley. Well, you've mentioned there about the the length and the breadth of depth and experience you've got in the uh, the professional sport world can we start off with you've given us a bit of an insight into your first sporting memory yeah it, it, the, the um that that was as, as a 11 12 year old playing at Shaw Cricket Club Shaw St Paul's Cricket Club where um I I had these I was a wiki keeper and I I, I took to the field with uh with boys who were significantly older than me and one of them was a really quick ball I remember standing further back in this game than I'd ever stood before and uh, I, I was nervous but there was a there was a it was a warm sunny evening and there was a decent crowd on and I don't remember anything about the game other than uh, thinking oh, I'm doing okay here and, and I'm enjoying this and this is this is good and, and whatever but I, was, I think I was because I was small uh, when we came off the field, and I can't remember whether we really won or or not, but but um, everybody stood up and gave me this uh, round of applause, and I I didn't know what it was for. It was probably it was probably in part because I was a little dot of a thing and uh, surrounded by these these teenage giants, but it stuck with me. And then people said, "Oh, you're really good," and and, and what have you. So from that that moment on, um, I was sort of bitten by uh, by this game, um, and, and probably wanted to have some of that um, that affirmation about my cricket every time I went out onto the field. It didn't last. And Stanley, why did you get into cricket? I, I my father my father played and um, but didn't really push me uh, at all. I played sport other sports, um, but I just had this. And I, I, I sort of even as a 11, 12 year old, I knew I had um, something that was a bit different. Uh, I, I, I'm loath to say a special skill, but but um, but it, it, I, I just I just found an ability to be able to catch instinctively and then to to do things with with wiki keeping gloves that people thought were really special that for me just seemed very easy and straightforward. And I, I probably in hindsight, wish I'd been better at a shorter form of a game, like an 80 minute game of rugby or a 90 minute game of football and, and probably all the, the, the money that went with that. But I, but I wasn't. Um, and I, I'm just, I think it stood out to everybody, but including myself, that I was head and shoulders better at cricket than I was at the other sports that I was playing. And when did you get a good insight that you were actually really pretty good at this? When did you get that kind of affirmation or that message that actually, wow, this could be something I could spend a lot of time doing or be good at, really good at? Yeah, I, I, my father, my father used to take me to all these games, and um, I'd, I, I knew it was okay, but I didn't. I sort of had nothing to gauge it against, and then I, 
I used to overhear him when I was meant to be in bed and there were people around at the home. I, I'd hear him proudly uh, regaling to friends of the, of, of the family about what other people had said about about me. And um, and so I, I thought, well, I, 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 had no, I had no real idea. But I, my father wasn't one for giving huge amounts of positive feedback. But he was, I could tell he was immensely proud of what, what these other people were saying. So I, I, I got a, an idea then. But I never really got any recognition representatively until I was 15, 15 16. Um, so I, I didn't sort of really buy into that. But then when I did get that recognition, I, you know, I knew where my level was quite quickly. And your recognition was what then at that sort of age? Was it good? playing in representative stuff from um, that was county? I, I'm, you know, played my first county representative cricket at the age of 16, and then quite quickly moved on to um, to north of England and played England under 19s and stuff like that. But um, but yeah, I, I didn't I didn't know that I was good enough to be a professional cricketer, which I, which um, you know that I think when I was eighteen, nineteen, I, I chose to go to Australia okay. um, to to further my career and also to to have an opportunity of being abroad. And that was that was a significant episode in my young life. And I came back and I was a much I, I went out a boy and definitely came back a man. And I was a different competitor because of that. And what was it that you got from that experience? Uh, the fact that I was tougher as a competitor than I realised, I I'd just really gone along with playing sport because I enjoyed it. Um, but in my first or second game in Australia, I was man caddied, which is uh, which is I was run out at the bowler's end by the by the bowler for backing up too far, and he gave me a bit of a send off for being a pommy so and so, and I properly laid into him, and I went. <laughs> And um, but I actually, it re that really drove me to to want to stick it right up these Aussies and everything. So so I I found something within myself then which allowed me to properly compete, and I I used that uh, more in my coaching career. That that realization that when that for me was getting in into a zone, definitely being focused, and I I found that. Uh, I didn't realize what the words were, but I knew that when that was my best state. Um, and so I can see that in others now when I'm working as a coach. Um, and also being away from the comfort blanket that your family provide. And so having to get on airplanes and meet people and go and coaching because we coached from Monday to Friday and then played uh, on Saturday and Sunday. That focus, Danny, and that sort of um, getting in the zone, where did that come from? Do you have a sense of where that was developed within you? I mean, you, you talk about that stage where you possibly recognised it in you, but do you know how you developed it, or is that just an innate part of you? It's, 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 not, it's not developed. It's, it's definitely an innate, an innate quality or um, characteristic, which I wasn't aware of at the time. Um, but that sense of injustice... Uh, and um, the sort of the right and wrongs of how to play the game that I've been brought up with were were completely that, that line was crossed by this bloke, and I realised that. Well, I didn't realise at the time, but I, I actually st stood up to this bloke, and and the umpires had to separate. I was like, I was like a little dog. He was he'd have, he'd have squashed me, but I I didn't care. I was I was like you know I I gave him what for. But anyway, they. The umpires actually did give me out, which made it worse. So I, I, I then realised that when I'm when sort of in, I'm faced with a challenge or or competition as as it as I felt it was, that was when I got the better out of myself. Wow. And then moving on through your career, then Stanley, there's also a sense of you've moved through into the professional realms of the game. Is there a um, uh, early on in your career, was there a, a, a motto or a phrase or a, a mantra that you've used to really help drive you forward to be successful in what you've done? I wasn't a successful professional player. Right. Um, and and I, I very quickly realised what my level was. Okay. Um, but I also learned retrospectively that 
um, and it's linked to this that last example. That, that, so when I played uh, the games that I did in a competitive environment, it was particularly when I played first team for Langs. I played 70 odd times. There was 44 first class and 28 one day games. Um, and every time I played, I, I was um, trying to avoid making a mistake in the vast majority of those games. I, I never, uh, probably in, uh, I'd say 10% of those games, seven or eight of those games, I actually got into the right proper state where I got into a competitive uh, mindset. Um, and so I learned from that experience and how that impacted on me as an individual. So when I played second team cricket, I, I found it much more easily, easy to get into that competitive mode. I, um, and uh, understanding why that, that probably happened for me was, has, has helped me deal with the vast majority, I think, of, of cricketers that I've worked with who are, in, who are not always in this, uh, the ideal state to perform. And that's powerful stuff, isn't it, in terms of that fear, fear of making a mistake, you said there, around how that got in your way of you performing at your very best. Yeah. I hear you correctly that actually when the fear was reduced somewhat by playing in the second team, you'd be able to perform at a greater level. Is that right? It's not so much. Fear is fears are quite an emotive word. I think it was, and I, but I used it because it felt like fear at the time. Right. I think it was... Um, uh, a realization that where my level was and I think my ceiling was probably I was better than second team cricket but my my keeping was good enough to to um, to be competitive in first team cricket but my batting simply wasn't and so um, so I it used to it put huge pressure on my my primary skill I wouldn't I wouldn't last two minutes in the modern day game in fact I don't know whether I get a contract because you, have, you know, it's changed significantly now. Um, but there would still be those same doubts and self-doubt, and that's what I had. I had self-doubt more than fear. Um, I think that would be probably more accurate. But it, at the time, it felt it felt pretty awful at times. Where, where when you'd had a, a poor experience, you know, um, it, it impacted on me significantly for those those times. How did you manage that self-doubt? Uh, I'm also kind of curious because you said I was not a, a successful professional or first class cricketer. And yet the benchmark might be, well, I, actually, you still played, you know, 100 times. Is that, is that not success? Yeah. You know, what, what is no, the, your measure of success? I, I think to influence games of cricket, I, I rarely influence games of cricket. Okay. I, um, I played in a, 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 in a one day semi final and I caught, I remember catching Derek Randall out one-handed which was probably on the highlights and I could now that was that was a significant contribution but I I I, I remember I probably might be people look back with rose-colored spectacles I might be looking back through um significantly dimmer colored <laughs> spectacle and, and remembering how uncomfortable it felt uh, on occasions which might have colored my my view I definitely didn't enjoy playing sport or cricket professionally as much as I did um, you know getting getting there um, and I and you know I've, I've since thought about the reasons reasons for that and I think it, it that it's, it's a it's a throwaway line fear of failure or embarrassment of making a mistake um, but whatever it was it was it was underneath the surface so I so I, so there were you know there were certain times where I, I know I got into a competitive mindset through what somebody what somebody had said um, comments that were being made and I never then thought about making a mistake and and so I sort of blundered my way through 12 years of a, of a professional career without really having the benefit of somebody saying you know somebody making me aware of of why I had these thoughts and, and mindsets but I see it so often in people that I work with and standing with the people you see it in, then how do you work with them now? So what are the tips and the tricks and the, from your valuable insight, do you kind of pass on now? Because fear of failure or self-doubt or whatever we want to term it is massive, isn't it? Not just in cricket, in all sports, yeah. but actually across life for so many people. Yeah. And I just wonder what insights you could share with our listeners in terms of how to maybe navigate that. I mean, it varies with, with individual to individual. Um, 
I, I, uh, I, I don't know that I've got a, a sticking plaster yeah. uh, solution for this. I think that they, there's, that there's a, um, a communication with the, with the player about what's, what's, got, what's coming up. For, uh, so, for example, I can, I can think of one, one instance where um, we, were, we being, I was part of the Lancashire first team and we were playing against Yorkshire at Headingley. We were in the changing rooms, which, are, uh, which were at the time were underneath the stand opposite to where they are now. So you couldn't have any view of the pitch. And I remember uh, looking around the, the dressing room and there was one bowler who I could tell, because uh, the, the, the crowd were making a huge, it felt a bit like gladiators, you know, you, were, you sort of <laughs> it did without over dramatizing it, but it did. And this player I could see was, um, uh, was uncomfortable. And so, um, so I, I, I just went up to him and, and I said, um, how are you doing? And he said, uh, um, in different language, I'm pretty nervous. Um, so I said, "Yeah, well, that's that's a good thing um, because because um, because the nerves get you ready to be able to, to go out and compete." So I said, "Are you are you fearful of anything?" And he said, "No, I'm not fearful." So I said, "What are you worried about?" And he said, I'm, "I'm just not sure of how I'm going to bowl." So then I does the and I said, "Well, well, when 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 I took the mid to the ball in the in the mid." Um, pre-match I said you you nailed every delivery so I think that so I said there's no reason why you can't do that I said just go out and, and do it this is I said you'll be fine when you get on the field now he bowled he bowled fine now I, I'm, that's amateur psychology but it, all it did was I just recognized somebody being uncomfortable and didn't allow them to go on the field or well I sort of stepped in because I could see that being a, a performance inhibitor um, now I suppose I've done that regularly with, with with individuals and tried to remind them of things that they've that they've done well. But with with certain players, it can often it can be a variety of things. I remember one player who was about to make his debut um, in the first team, uh, and he had he was exactly the opposite. He was he was he was not, not particularly nervous or what have you. And I said I said how are you? He said I'm fine. I said do you want to bowl something into the net? He said yes. And then his first five or six deliveries were really poor. And I put my my thinking, I was thinking, God, if that had been me, I'd be nervous now. And I said, oh, he said, I, I'm okay. He said, I just need to get this feeling. Once I get the feeling, I'll be fine. And then he, he bowled several more deliveries. Then he said, oh, that's it. I've got it. I've got it. Got it. And I said, right, well, let's stop. He said, yeah, no, I'm good. Good to go. Um, and he got five for on debut. Um, so the difference between this player who was nervous prior, prior to the match at, at Headingley had had quite a bit of experience and what have you. But I think it was just... The chanting and the, the the sort of the intimidation factor of having a big crowd on and, and, and what have you. This other player who, um, who who did ultimately have some issues with mental issues with the with the game, but but found this sort of this performance trigger for him and knew that as soon as he got that feel uh, that he was good to go. And, and Stanley, did you pick that up as a kind of a coach and a person because of what you yeah. didn't receive? And actually, how you were not managed, or how you were managed, does that make sense? No, I, I, I think I became more aware of. I, I, I could, I knew the differences, uh, the the disparity mm. of, uh, of of me uh, and my performances when I was in a poor state or a good state. The sort of the differences, rather, when I was, and, and they were quite marked. Mm. So that wasn't lost on me, and I could, I, I also, my. My aim was to get players to be able to perform immediately at, at next levels from ball one was my philosophy um, and still is to this day. So I had to appreciate that there would be some difficulties along the way and they would need some support along the way. But what that support uh, ultimately ended up being was determined by what I thought they needed. Um, so sometimes it wasn't always, it wasn't always nicey nicey either. Um, sometimes I would, um, I'd have to bare my teeth when I thought people were uh, coasting or, or what have you. So it was just an appropriateness of, of intervention. But I suppose it, it was shaped by my own experiences to a degree. Um, and I, I just, I didn't want people to waste time, waste, waste. I'm not saying I wasted my career, but I, but I, I think I could have been a better performer in my career with some 
different support um, and that's that's really the point and it's really crucial that, isn't it in terms of actually who we are now in terms of maybe the second part of your career and how that's been informed by your experiences as a player you know and i think you're, you're bearing a lot of uh, insight there in terms of actually the, the good bits and the bad bits and your experiences and how they inform what you do and I, I guess i'm moving us on i'm now kind of curious as to those qualities seem to me like real strong coaching qualities that you were picking up and I, when was it that you realized that actually you were a coach and that coaching was for you it, it was during the the trip to australia in 1977 78 um where i um, I played as I mentioned but we also went around the area it was Queensland that we were based North Queensland in particular so having to go around um, to these various camps each each week um, you, you you've I sort of found my feet as a as a coach uh, I, you know, I was I was pretty raw they couldn't understand the northern accent so i, I came back from australia speaking speaking fully fledged queensland that was uh all my mates said what are you talking like that for stunning and i was like good eye man how are you going i was giving it all that um but so i had to i had to be understood first and foremost and then i, I sort of learned about communication and then i learned what was working um with players and but i i think again there was sort of a little bit like the, the instinct I had for wiki keeping, I had an instinct that seemed so natural for, for coaching. So I, when I came back, um, I took a, a teaching degree because I was going to be a PE teacher. I, I thought professional cricket passed me by, passed me by. So I, I uh, went to college, got a degree, um, and was going to go into teaching when Lancashire stepped in and offered me a playing contract. But I had what I'd done then. I think the the six months in Australia had, had taught me a lot um, um, all sorts of, of, of skills which it, it would have it took me I don't know whether the three years at university people had the same uh, level of experiences or um, you know I, th I think I probably had more in those six months condensed time than I did in three years at, at college but I was definitely you know a, um, a pretty pretty okay coach I think you mentioned your philosophy and your key principles as to what you're all about. When did you know about that? When did you start realizing, you know, what sort of a coach you were and what you brought to coaching and developing of people? Yeah, I do remember. I do remember having to properly sit myself down and give myself a, a, a talking to about, about this. And that, that, that really was around... Uh, some 360 feedback that we were given I think as part of a might have been a level four process or even before that um, because I'd, I'd been working um, when I finished playing I'd been working uh, with with Lanks in a in a capacity which was had responsibility for their representative program so I knew what I wanted from um, from that program having been in it um, and also seeing players come through it and how it could be done much better, given my experiences abroad, but also my experiences at, at university and, and having taught a little bit during the off-season, cricket off-season. So I, I sort of had, a, had a, an idea of what I wanted. The 360 feedback, I asked, I asked people who, who didn't particularly like me to give me, the, to give me some feedback. And they, Did you find many people like that? <laughs> didn't like <laughs> Well, I knew who they were. Yes, I saw. I sort of I knew there was. I, I knew that a player had given a bit of a hard time to, and um, uh, my my uh, boss. Uh, we didn't quite see eye to eye about our approaches. So, so the feedback I got from both of those and one more was uh, was quite, quite hurtful, to be honest. Um, and we were reading them out in in. Um, in groups and, and what have you, and I was I was sort of blown away by by the by the strength of these comments that I didn't re I wasn't really listening to what this this present uh, the lecturer come present uh, presenter was trying to say, um, and so I got asked the question randomly, what what is my philosophy, and I, and I I I couldn't come up with with something, I and I was slightly lost, um, and then I spoke with my 
some of my peers and they said, Stanley, you know, you know exactly what you're doing. You, we've seen you operate, we know, we've heard you. And I said, yeah, but I just couldn't articulate what my philosophy was. Um, but it, what he did not make me do then was to sort of sit down and, and then sort of look at how I do operate and what, what it was that I, I was doing so that I could put it on a piece of paper and what have you. Not, not just because I thought that was valuable or I didn't want to be embarrassed. But I thought it. I thought it was essential that I could articulate what my philosophy was. Well, my understanding of my philosophy or what my philosophy is was um, it wasn't as a, a source of embarrassment that I couldn't articulate it. But I, I and I, I sort of I was operating at what was a, I thought was a decent level. But the fact that I was unable to say what it was that I did in a in a short sentence um, made me uncomfortable. So I, I wanted to be able to articulate it, not to, to save me any embarrassment, but because I could see the value of having a, a, a vision. Um, and then from there, you, you, you then have various um, pillars or elements to support that vision. And so once I'd got that, I thought, right, well, so I, and I've, I've altered it a little bit, uh, but it's something I use to this day. And it, I, I work more, much more closely with that vision with, with the girls then um, it's more explicit, I think, my vision and how I work with the girls than it was with the lads. I think it was my my manner that with the in the men's game that made it clear what I was about. How would you articulate it? I think this is such a, an important aspect because, you know, a lot of coaches nowadays are asked, you know, what is your philosophy? And some people go, well, why is that important? And hearing your story and the uh, longevity that you've had in the game and, and therefore even referring back to the importance of having a, an approach philosophy and being able to articulate it and seeing that as important. I think it's a really powerful message for those people yeah. coming through. And I'm just wondering, you know, how would you describe your philosophy? And I know there isn't a right or a wrong way. What does it mean to you when I say, what's your philosophy? Well, I think this is in part why, why I didn't, I wasn't able to articulate what it actually was. What I could do was say, look, what I put in place was this and that and, and the other, which related to a real desire to allow players to get better. And then when they were getting better, to understand in what ways that they were getting better. And then when they were tested at next levels, because we were working um, at, at quite a high level. When they, get to, when they got to those next levels, they were able to compete in cricket matches right from the start. So that shaped everything that we did. But um, but what I what I hadn't done was sort of put that down in in written form and understood the value of it. And and then when when I moved to the job that I've got now into the women's game, that 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 philosophy was was so important because what it gave me previously, but what it's definitely done now is given me definitely you, you you have to be clear on what, what you what you're doing what your purpose is to be authentic so i think the the fact that i operate uh, quite explicitly around my my philosophy and what i'm hoping for for the girls when they're part of the program that i'm responsible for is this clarity about why we're doing what we're doing um and and and, and, and it's quite simple. So my, my philosophy is to be to enable uh, you to be able to compete at the next level from ball one. So it's and quite it's quite basic and quite and quite it's it's not you know it's nothing special, but it's something that uh, myself and the staff work and the players now work very closely with. And, and me knowing you as I do, Stanley, as well, there is something for me around your philosophy and it, which plays to what you've suggested there about where you work in the performance pathway in terms of you know you've often spent your time working at the top end of the development performance pathway as, as i've got to know you and hear you and you know i think this is a question that comes out a lot for a lot of people aspire to want to be the first team coach or they are very good at working in the grassroots but i think what you you epitomize for me is that you spent all of your career largely working in that performance pathway towards the top end of it preparing as you say players to really perform at their best but keep pushing the boundaries i'm kind of really curious again relaying it back to your story that you say you were uh, you know a, a not as 
good a professional cricketer as you might have hoped or could have been, but actually how you have used that power and that desire and that passion to keep driving people forward to perform at their very, very best. Does that, yeah. does that ring true for you, do you think? Yeah, it does. I, I, I had a, a, um, an opportunity to, to coach the first team at Lancashire in 1996, which was uh, because David Lloyd Bumble um, was given, he was the head coach at the time, he was given uh, the head coach with England. Um, and that took place, I think it was in February or March of, of, of that year. And so the, the, the county were left in a, a difficult position without a, a head coach. And um, I think that the players, a lot of the players were homegrown, had come through the system that I've been responsible for. And it, I think it was at their sort of, uh, not insistence, but I, I think they sort of put me forward. And so the, the, the county offered me uh, the role for the 1996 season. And it started with the term I was I was interim head coach, and then um, after uh, about four or five weeks, I was then made acting head coach. And <laughs> it, that doesn't really smack of any permanence, does it? Really. Um, and uh, we had a really successful year. Uh, the Lancashire side at the time were, were uh, quite a strong side, but we won the two one-day competitions in that year. And um, my ego wanted me, was saying, right, well, I want to be the, the head coach. Um, but when I think back to those times, the, the enjoyment was the actual winning of the games of cricket. But I felt as though I was managing, I was like a psychoanalyst as opposed to a coach. Uh, and just, and just uh, keeping the lid on, on various issues between individuals strong individuals within the team um and and managing that so that that, that we didn't lose sight of our task so they were reason, reasonably socially cohesive but they were odd ones who were difficult uh, and it was just managing that and did i enjoy it? i yeah i it, well it gave me it gave me uh, an awareness that um managing people in the right sort of way you can get you you can achieve really good results and that and we did get some good results i didn't get the same intrinsic reward from working at that level as i did lower down um and that i think it's just people have different skill levels it wasn't i'm not intimidated by working at first team level it's just i felt it was always something that i should aspire to do um and and i was probably lucky to get an opportunity in the way that i did but it, it wasn't something that I then pursued thereafter. Yeah, and I like that bit about your recalling or reflecting back on what gave you the intrinsic value. So great experience and opportunity, but actually I'm seeing here now, actually what really floats your boat is actually the development um, of the technical and the tactical and the person in terms of their development in cricket, you know, and actually how you position yourself and, and mm -hmm. therefore give you that intrinsic value. I think it, it's the shifts in, in, in people's, uh, awareness of of uh, of how good they could be, which again harks back to some of my experiences, personal experiences. But the the um, the scene, the, the shifts. Now that that those shifts can be in a variety of ways. They can be technical, um, but but sometimes I think there's probably too much emphasis placed on technical development. It, it's it's necessary, but but so is the opportunities to that you can provide for the people at the right time when they're deserving of those opportunities and then then their techniques can be you can help shape their techniques for the demands of that that next level it just asks and poses questions to me in a in a way that um uh, i didn't i didn't experience as a head coach but if i if i'd had finished my career without having the opportunity to have led at some stage at the, right at the sharp end I, I would have probably felt as though i'd missed out on something but i, I didn't know after. do you think the head coach allows you to really shift people on in their performance you know a lot of what i hear is actually a head coach's role there are such, there are smaller gains yes and you're, you're polishing and helping people develop but actually yeah. the great wins and the bigger gains are, are at an earlier stage in their performance pathway I agree entirely, and that that's where the that's where the enjoyment mm. for me 
comes from and where the, the sort of the relationships I have with with people to this day uh, still remain because because you build a, a rapport and then a, a sense of trust and, and a relationship that's based on a number of factors and you go through some good times and not so good times but that the learning that they have and that that I think you know I appreciate it but they definitely do appreciate it it's sometimes difficult when you can't you know sometimes you it's just unfortunately you can't give everybody opportunities um but but they understand that and as long as you're consistent and you are and, and again this I've used the word once already but you have to be authentic and and be true to yourself um and if you are like that then you, you you'll build relationships that can last a lifetime and that, that that's that's been nice but you, you mentioned there about the good times and the not so good times and you, you've had the the fabulous opportunity to work in one of the uh, the the top county clubs within the country can you recall one or two of your proudest moments within your career or possibly even being at Lanx? Yeah, the, the, the one that's obvious to me is that I, I set up a, a scouting network um, of, of people who, um, who watched a lot of cricket in the leagues and the club wanted some formal structure to, to things. So I set this up um, and I, I'd, I'd sort of really lived off recommendations from people ringing me up, and, but the club wanted a formalised structure to things. So we set, we set this up. And then um, from nowhere, I got a phone call from uh, a parent of, of two players who actually ended up being professional creators, not with Lancashire, Michael and David Brown, who played at Burnley. And she rang me up and um, her husband was captain of Burnley's first team and was ironically one of the people that I'd chosen as one of my scouts. Good man, uh, sound thinker. Um, and Val, Val really was just a supportive uh, mother and wife and, and what have you but from nowhere she rang me up and said John I'm, it's Val Brown here she said I hope you don't mind me ringing I'm thinking oh something there'll be something up with Michael or David so I said is everything okay she said no it's fine she said well, it's just I just I just felt I needed to, to, to speak to you um, she said that she said Peter and the lads keep coming back from indoor practice and they keep mentioning this lad have you heard of a lad called James Anderson so I said no I've not heard of him she said he's, he's only played a little bit um, he said he might have the odd game for Langs under 15s, but nothing came of it. But they keep mentioning. She said, "I know you've got some nets at under under 17s. Would you would you mind having a look at him?" So I said, "No," uh, and because it came from her, I, I had a look, and so he came down. Um, uh, never said anything to anybody. He was, he was so shy and, and quite introverted. Bowled beautifully. Uh, you know, you know, it, it wasn't. It wasn't a reflection of the career that he's had, but it was it was pretty good. He got he got clunked on the head batting, and then I said, "Do you want to you know Do you want to come out?" And he said, "No, no, no, I'm all right." So I thought, oh, "That's quite good." So um, so there started the journey with um, with one of England's greatest ever cricketers, um, and it came from absolutely nowhere. He, you know, he'd not played at all, and then that year he played in Aaron's seventeens, and then. Um, played him in the under 19s, and then he, England saw him at under 19 level, and then and his career went and upwards for a time, and then he, he signed a signed a. Well, he was there was some doubt about whether Lancashire were going to sign him, and uh, another bowler called Kyle Hogg, and I remember being in a committee meeting at Lancashire, and uh, the club were wanting to sign Stephen Kirby, who was a Lancashire bowler who played. Um, uh, for Leicester and um, and was looking to move and they were very keen to sign him and I, and I said well, I understand that he's a you know, really really good grip but we've got two belting young bowlers here I said if we sign you know Stephen they're going to be playing too much in the second team and, and then somebody a former player said well can you guarantee that he'll get, get, you, get us 50 wickets in the first team so I said no I can't do that but um, if you if you wanted me to back them then I will and they said right well, I backed them, but I've also backed myself into a corner. Um, I'm thinking, well, yeah, but I do, I do rate both of them, and both of them had, you know, well, Jim has been an international superstar, and Kyle Hogg was a fundamental uh, part of Lancashire's attack for over a decade. So, so it worked out well. Stanley, what did you have to do to back yourself, though? What do you think your approach was with these, you know, two up and coming young? cricketers with a bucket loads of potential and I'm wondering you know looking back at your reflections 
what did you do to make sure that you got the best out of them? Oh, do you know, I, 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 um, I've explored this again with various courses that I've been on and, and what have you. Um, but there was, there was an instinct with, with both, um, which I've had, I think, throughout my coaching career. So that this, you know, this term gut reaction um, I would definitely apply in those. Because I had a gut reaction that, you know, that they were going to be first class cricketers and do well. Um, and I've had that uh, with other players before and then and a lot more since. Um, and to be honest, I, I didn't want to overcomplicate it because I relied on it and it was it was quite um it was a, quite a, a strong selection tool or recommendation tool i think that the 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 only thing i've added is that just to make sure that their performance record around um around what i'm seeing matches up but if if i'd have used that with jimmy anderson he wouldn't have been he wouldn't have been probably in, involved in a net session um but that whole thing, Stanley, about gut reaction, I play with that idea a lot. And some people will say, well, that's rubbish. You know, it's not about gut reaction. And, and I know you use this and you've shared this with me before. How do you help a young a coach coming through who either wants to make those sort of identification choices and can't access that gut feel? Or, you know, what do you base your gut feel on? Because there must be something informing it, I'm, I'm guessing. Yeah. I, I, there will be, uh, yeah, and I think they, to a degree, that is um, experience. I, right. I think it's knowledge. Um, but there's, there's also some indefinable quality, or quality, I sound like I'm blowing hot air up my own backside here, but, but there is something that I think is very difficult to, to pass on to others about uh, talent identification or, or um, this sort of uh, an instinct about about something um, and, and I, it, it is for other people who, who who may be listening who have a similar experience that um, it, it, there will be there will be a combination of of my own experiences my own training my own knowledge that I've acquired that allow me to be able to make a judgment and I and it and often it was quite quick. I could I could make an assessment. One, it wasn't just playing. I'd, I'd have to spend time with them, and what have you. But having spent six months with Jimmy, I, I didn't have any um, reservations about recommending him for a for a, a pro contract. Would you say there was any one or two things that they gave you back that you recognised within you that you said right? those are the key ingredients that I needed to receive in order to recommend. Again, very much like you, we talked about earlier, it varies. So um, with Kyle Hogg, yeah. Kyle Hogg is one of the nicest blokes uh, you, you, you want to meet. And, um, and so I, I didn't really know his character. We had a game of football pre-match and I remember him uh, clattering me uh, off the ball um, because because we were in competition, it was it was in in hindsight it was it was ridiculous really with, the, with how we were playing football to that intensity. But he just he he properly, and I sort of you know I gave him a little bit back, and he and he was only a kid, he was only seventeen, but he properly, and it, I remember I remember you know that sticking with me, um, and I've seen that similarly with other players, as sort of from from nowhere this competitive edge in you know a game of pool in a in a pub um i remember one player who who just didn't want to get off he wouldn't be beaten and and and, what have you. and yet i thought he was a bit too soft and i saw i sort of I changed my view i've been seeing you know seeing this this this, this uh aspect of him and then uh, one of the first academy players a lad called tom smith who um who i've actually coached with recently um, Tom again, very nice demeanour, and then we got him in a competition, and he crawled over his grandmother to 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 get to the winning line first. So those were things that that were obvious. But uh, there's 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 other things like um, Liam Livingston and 
um, uh, Matthew Parkinson, who were both, I think they would be the first to admit, were precocious young teenagers, for want of a better and more appropriate phrase for, for both of them. Um, and uh, and that, I think, coloured people's judgment about them as cricketers. But I'd, I'd seen Liam Livingston hit a cricket ball. Um, and despite all his, his sort of bravado, he still had a, the time to play and then hit this ball so beautifully. And Matt Parkinson, he wasn't the greatest of fielders. Uh, he was a difficult teenager. Thought he knew it all, but you got the ball in his hand, and he looked like a, a young Shane Warne. So, um, and, and he, he had this such such self belief. Um, came into, I brought him into a first team net, and uh, he bowled against this this opening batter. And he said, "I'll get him out." Nick 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 off at first slip. So I said, oh, all right, "Okay then." And he set his field and what have you. And within four balls, this lad, he, he, he had a little chirp at him. And he was in a little chirp at him. And this, this first team players thought, you little so-and-so has gone after him and nicked it, nicked it to slip. And he's gone running down the pitch. So you so uh, you don't forget little things like that. And they, they do inform you. But that, that's the difference between, you know, um, some technical input, some uh, competitive drive some fight and, and what have you. So there's, there's not one thing that I could then pass on and say, look for this particular quality. Yeah, but, but I'm also hearing though, you spotting all of these small little ingredients and keeping your eyes and ears open all of the time is actually kind of informing your gut instinct. You know, it's yeah. actually giving you the memory bank of things to look for. And it's about pulling all of those ingredients together and forming a, a, a view, is that fair? You know it is, and and I, you've just stimulated another thought. We, uh, when I was at Lanks, we um, we had a, a player called Lewis Reese, who's now with Derbyshire, and uh, he batted um, a little bit, and well, not more than a little bit. He was a he was a, he was trying to get by as an all rounder, uh, and things didn't work out for him with us. Uh, and I said, look, you know, at the moment there's there's not any openings for us, and he and he dusted himself off. Um, he started playing for the Unicorns, which was a side that played uh, in the first class games at the time. I went to Leeds Bradford University and and then changed from being a, a trying to be an all rounder into a batter that bowled occasionally. And I know that Yorkshire were keen to sign him. Um, and I got three calls from these well meaning people, not, not necessarily scouts, but people ringing up saying, Stanley, are you sure about Lewis Reese? And I said, No, why, why are you saying this? I've just seen him score. Eight yard again, so it's the best innings I've seen from a young player. For da, da, da. and then somebody else would ring, and somebody else would ring. So, I'm, so that was enough then for me, even without seeing that, to take a punt on you know on getting him into our, our second team and what have you. Then when I saw him play in the second team, um, you know, I, I, within within I don't know, five or six weeks, I was recommending for a contract. So yeah, it's not just me. Um, you know, I do need people who, who, whose judgment or whose opinion I, I, I respect uh, that helps form mine. So, Stanley, flipping that a little bit, there's been many highs and we've talked about some of the, the proud moments and successes. Any downsides? You know, what, what's some of the, the, the biggest challenges that you've had and how have you mani- managed to navigate through those? Yeah, so I, I'd spent 32 years at Lanks, so... so um, and we had a successful setup, which had, uh, which would incorporated the academy, which I was proud to be the first academy director there, and to set up the, a system that supports that properly. And um, and we we being Langs had just uh, signed three seventeen year old players from our system, which was unprecedented to sign three at seventeen years of age: Hasib, Hamid, Saki Mahmood, and Matthew Parkinson. Um, so I was really, really chuffed that we'd been able to to do that, and they'd, they'd the club had um, had agreed to my recommendation. And then within six months or so, I was uh, found myself out the door, and that was a disappointment. A disappointment to um, to lose my job at a place that I that I loved, uh, and it was just left a, an uncomfortable taste for a time. And then. Uh, uh, through that that period though is when I started to to really understand 
you know, what got me out of bed in the morning. Um, and I had a wake up call, I started to work for myself. I, we did a bit of work together, David, and I sort of learned from you about skills of mentoring, which I, I don't have half of your skills uh, and realized, didn't realize that. But I, I'd, I'd applied for a job to really just to get back on, on the horse, so to speak. It was a job at a, a college. And I spoke to this, this, this person about it. She rang me up and asked what I was doing. I said, I'd, I'd just applied for this job. And there was a silence on the phone. So she said, what have you done that for? And I, I came out with some half-truthed reason for me applying. And she said, well, that's not you. She said, you could do that in your sleep. She said, you really need to start to understand what got you out of bed uh, in the morning doing the Lanx job. And so she suggested a number of things. And one thing that stuck with me was um, the Simon Sinek and why a 15 minute TED talk. Um, and what that made, it, it tells a story within that about the Wright brothers. Um, and <laughs> without boring your listeners, it, the, why it was powerful was because the Wright brothers were just a, um, a some brothers and that had family who, who came up with this idea, which meant a lot to them about the first man powered flight. Um, and um, it was this commitment to, to what they were doing and the understanding of the, the, the themselves and the friends and the family knew why they were doing what they were doing. So they would go out and even though they had plenty of failures, they'd keep going into all times of hours of the day to, to try and get forward with this this dream of theirs and that contrasted with a bloke who i'd never heard of before that he mentioned called samuel langley i think he was and he said nobody will have ever heard of samuel langley and he said but he was in competition with the Wright brothers he was um being uh, sponsored by the new york times he had influential people supporting him because they loved this idea um but all he was wanting really to do was to get some fame and fortune. He wasn't he wasn't uh, into the actual building of, aer of this airplane and trying to, to achieve what the Wright brothers were doing. And then as soon as the Wright brothers achieved it, he stopped straight away. So rather than him having any desire to go, oh, uh, you know, well done, you guys, let's see what, how I can, he just stopped straight away because he couldn't be the first. Now, it was that story and that that TED talk which made me really um, focus in on what what it was I wanted to do and and why more 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 importantly. Gosh, and that was the <laughs> uh, you know really again really influential turning point in your career and your life really you know from hearing the coming towards the end of a, a very long association with Lancashire which must have been quite a shock to therefore having to pivot and turn again and go again you know and there's a there's a theme that's coming up for me which is around self-belief you know and there was something for me in the early stages where you talked about your self-belief not being so great and then as, as I'm hearing you talk about your your time as a coach at Lancashire and the impact you had on different people and really understanding the motivations and the drives and the purposes of individuals it sounded like your self-belief was really quite strong as a coach you know you believed that you could make a difference you talk about your gut feeling and backing it you know and I think that's yeah. really really strong stuff to really hold on to because you know you're being judged there's lots of questions around the talent identification aspects of your job and yet you made some really big calls and had to really back yourself and then I'm hearing, you know, after having the knock of being asked to leave a, a club you've had an association with for so many years, it must have really knocked your, your self-belief. But you managed to get back up on, on relatively quickly with, with a bit of help. You know, and where are you with that all now in terms of your self-belief as a coach? I, I think the self-belief is, is an interesting one because what, what I used to envy when I was a cricket player, a professional cricket player, was what I could see was quite transparent was the self-belief of a, a number of, of the, the real top players that I played with. And, I, and I, I just didn't know where that came from because I didn't have any of it. Um, and I'm not comparing a coaching career to a playing career, but I do know that I have um, significant self-belief as a practitioner. And in part, I, I, a, bit like a, a bit like a talented player who doesn't always know where that where he's learnt his talent from. I don't quite know where I've got that self-belief from. 
Um, I know I've made mistakes, and I, I, I think everybody does, but, but, but I've learned from those. And they've, I think, have added to, to this, this feeling of self-confidence about as a practitioner. I wouldn't even say, you know, you've allowed yourself to make mistakes and that's what's built the confidence. Because I yeah. guess even as a player, you, you talked a lot about not being able to really take risks and make mistakes. There was such a fear of that, which really disabled you in some ways whereas as a as a coach having that freedom to make more mistakes and feel free you're actually your performance level is just rocketed and your self-belief and motivation is kind of drawn around that i had a there was a there was a in this in this the year that i i, I did uh act as the as the head coach with lanks we had a, a situation where we had an overseas well an overseas pro so to speak he, he was an overseas player who was from south africa who, who actually now works with the ecb a bloke called steve elworthy who played international cricket for south africa and when we um I, when we came to a selection committee meeting for uh, to pick the side for for the final this was in in um july maybe against uh, northampton um i didn't i didn't favor the selection of Steve Elworthy, um, but yeah, we had Clive Lloyd, who, who's you know a great iconic cricketer, um, who sat on our cricket committee, who, was, who wanted to go into the, the match with four seamers, and I I wanted to play Gary Yates, who actually is again ironically is my successor as Lancashire's academy director. So, but it, but he was a really effective bowler on surfaces, which I thought Lords was now. I'd only played at Lords two or three times, but I just had this again this instinct, and I I said I don't think we should should play Steve Elworthy. I want to go with Gary Yates, <laughs> which which was random. Um, and uh, when we, we we sort of spoken the night before, myself and Mike Watkinson about about this, and then. Uh, what made this more difficult was that on the morning of the game, his father had flown in from South Africa to watch his son play, and um, and yet there was enough. This 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 voice inside me w w was saying, "No, it's the right thing." Although it's and I I knew that, well, I knew that the ramifications if we'd have lost the game and Gary Yates, but I ne never thought that way. Which again links back to what I was saying as a player. I never thought of the what ifs. This is the right decision. This is what we should go with. And uh, when we told him, you know, that, 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 was, uh, that was something else to have to deal with. Um, but the, the learning experience of, of the fact that I, I didn't make a soft choice or we didn't make a soft choice. Um, so that stuck with me as something that when I was really under the cosh, my thinking was quite clear. And so, I've never doubted my myself since as a as a coach. And Stanley, working in a club like Lancashire with you know a, a number of really really talented cricketers, both for the club and for the country, you know, I'm sure you had to make quite a lot of difficult choices along the way, or even within the second team environment. You know, the pressure that you had to probably endure at times, and the uh, the need to be successful must have been quite. Well, I, I also hear probably a, a driving force in terms of actually really wanting to continue to improve. Now, you've, you've got some, um, a couple of big characters that have always been associated with Lancashire. Um, I do know you have a, one particular story, which just before we move on towards the wrapping up the, the podcast around Mr. Flintoff. Now, would you like to just share that with our listeners? Yeah, but it, but it also links into um, some some of my experiences as a, as a young player where when I went into Lancashire's second team, the, the the captain at the time was was Harry Pilling, who was uh, a diminutive batter who, who was well known for sharing uh, partnerships for Lancashire's first team with Clive Lloyd, who was at least a foot and a bit taller than him. Yeah. But I never forgot the way that he made me feel at ease as a as a youngster going into those environments and the the value that I I could see of that of allowing young people to. Uh, be able to play and express themselves was one of the things that I was very keen on on continuing when I when I was captain and coach of the second team and and the, the Andrew Flintoff story was that he came in as this precocious talented young lad um, he was he was uncomfortable in the environment you could tell he he played the game and then wouldn't shower and so 
I made him, I made him have a shower. Um, uh, and I laughed because of the language I used at the time, which would be completely inappropriate now, but I sort of made him uh, have a shower and, and, told, and I told him not to worry about stuff like that. You need to have a shower, but I could t still see he was uncomfortable. And, and so we, you know, one of the things was, we couldn't keep calling him Andrew because it was a bit formal, you know? So, so I thought, well, we can't call him, you know, Andy, that still doesn't go or what have you. And then Flint or Flintstones. So I said, I'm going to call you Fred after Fred Flint. And, and so I christened him with the name Fred. And then some a generation later, when he's helping England win the Ashes for the first time in 2005, I did three, tele, uh, three TV um, interviews because I'd given him this name. And on the third one, because I'd listened to one of them, I was a bit miserable and not really me. I was trying to make it, you know, saying like, saying that it was me who was winning the Ashes because I'd given him this bloody nickname. And I, anyway, so th th this this company turned up and said, uh, "Can we, uh, can we have an interview?" So I said, "Yeah, uh, but I need to have some lunch first because it was a second team game." And so I, I hurriedly had this chicken and uh, and then and then did the interview, and then went back into the dressing rooms um, and I smiled a lot because I, I smiled more. I thought, you know, make make more fun of this what I did, and I kept smiling. So I've gone back in the dressing room to do me um, the end of lunch talk, ready for them to go out on the field. And they've gone, uh, Stanley, have you just done a TV interview? So I said, yeah, I have. Uh, they said, uh, what, just like that? So I said, yeah, why? And I'm looking, I'm looking at the flies or what have you, but I knew it was a head and shoulder shot. I said, go and check yourself in the mirror. So I, I went into the bathroom and uh, they think, <laughs> I, had, I had chicken stuck all on my teeth. I had lo it looked like the worst dentist job ever. And I'm going, Fred, I gave me in the name Fred. And I'm again, <laughs> give this thing. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so he's on TV regular now, and um, and yeah, it's 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 a good line at a party. Well, Stanley, I think what you do for me, and what's come out very clear through our conversation today, is is a line that you've just shared, actually, and it? it's about the importance of making people feel comfortable and feel good, and the importance of that in the coaching environment, in the playing environment, and in, in in all of the environments that you work. And you know, the way you've shared your story today. Um, in a very sort of open and humble way and the massive impact you've probably had on so many people some of which were is very well documented but I'm sure there's still many more people to come yet which have not absolutely fulfilled and shown the value and the impact that you've had on them over the years and I know you're still working with a number of players in the in the women's game and for England and I know that you're having a great impact on them you know I really appreciate you sharing all of that um, and, and thank you for that. What I would like to do, though, for our listeners and to also help and make them feel good is to share a couple of nuggets along the way. And uh, I'm going to fire a few quick fire questions at you and hopefully give them a few takeaways. Uh, and this is based on probably your journey and your story to hopefully they can steal, borrow and, and then go and impact on whatever they do. What books along the way have really impacted on you, whether they've been in the past or, or currently? I'm not a great reader uh, of books. I'm a great reader of um, of stuff on my iPad, though. Uh, but uh, the one thing that has stuck with me would be, uh, as I understand, this is in Blink, where whereby this this understanding of where expertise is and the examples of expertise that um, that are mentioned in that book. Um, so I, I I forgive my ignorance, um, literally. Uh, 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 reading but but that would be one thing that sticks in my mind and, and any any other things that you've picked up along the way any other reference places whether they be books or not but I'm just thinking you know what what who's informed you and informed your thinking uh, well the, when I spent um, my first year at college was one of the most influential people was a bloke called Bill Bezik who was a yeah is a psychologist and um he got us to read i had to read then uh, which was barbara knapp and the skill in sport and it was about understanding skill acquisition um and what have you but it was it wasn't so much the book as the way that bill brought the the principles of that book to life in his in the way that he he ran his lectures um uh, and I learned significantly from him, not just new knowledge, um, but also from him as a practitioner as well. 
Good stuff. Okay, so um, a couple of a couple of book references there, um, but also I'm hearing you. You're you're a person for picking things up on the way, and I, I also recall back your um, listening to TED talks and the Simon Sinek TED talks, and I'm sure that's had quite a bit of influence on you and your career from from what I can pick up. Yeah. Okay. Um, in terms of technology, then you've mentioned there that your iPad's quite big. What what would you say is um, a real key piece of technology or software that really informs and supports you? To be the person you are today i've shifted on this um so um when i when i was working previously in at lancashire the the technology was i suppose in its infancy about uh, with, with uh using uh images it, we, it, people had, had, had taken footage video footage of, of players previously um on these big uh, like tv cameras that used to sit on your shoulders and things like this whereas uh, it was getting uh, the technology was moving at a pace, and uh, we started to use. Uh, a, 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 I can't remember the name of it now, but we we started to use this technology, which which was able to compare um, a, a player's best practice with where they were currently at, and to see whether there were any differences in um, in 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 their technique. It was technically it was technique biased, and and to a degree. Uh, biomechanics right. um, and we used to spend we being the, the coach and stuff and I used to spend quite a bit of time uh, using this and showing this and what have you yeah. that the where I've moved on it is that I, there's still a place for that um, but I think there's a, a danger of being preoccupied with technique and um, sometimes the game can be the best teacher uh, without you having to be perfect, a perfect technician, an effective competitor and, and winner of, of periods of games and winners of cricket matches you know, are not always the greatest technicians, but they apply what they've got most effectively. So I've moved away from technique being the answer to things and more um, being able to apply that in in pressure situations and against, you know, when the when the when things are happening quite quickly. So at the higher levels, things happen very quickly and you have to deal with that and adapt and what have you. So I've definitely gone more, uh, more interested in, in the impact of, of psychology, uh, again, which relates back to my own experiences, but, but I'm now using that far more regularly in the women's game than I did in the men's. Lovely, good stuff. Okay, um, so Stan, are you Again, we've talked about a performance journey um, and your desire and drive to help people perform at their very best. Now, I'm going to flip that to you in terms of how, how do you prepare to perform at the very best day in, day out now, you know, physically and mentally? Yeah, um, physically, I, I'm still pretty active. Uh, I've had some health issues recently with, with cancer, but, uh, but I've had an operation and, I've, and, and I'm I'm in remission and hopefully that will continue. So I've had to look after myself. Well, I've chosen to look after myself because it's one of the bigger challenges that, you, that anybody faces. So, um, so I've looked after myself in that way. I think that what I've learned is that I've got a, I've got a natural, I believe I've got a natural communicative style. Um, but when I'm working with players, I make sure that I've done my homework in advance so that, um, that, I'm, not, I'm just not talking for the sake of talking. There's actually some, some real substance to what, what I'm about. So I will have done my homework well in advance so that it allows me then to speak naturally and to make people feel comfortable and what have you. But then I know that if I've got some nuggets about a player, I can bring them out and bring them to the party at an appropriate time. Great, that's really powerful. And, and it's actually a theme that comes through in terms of people working at the top of their game is actually what allows them to be their best is their preparation and their homework yeah. that they do. So it's really, really powerful. Um, moving on, if you were to win the lottery and, and have a significant amount of money come your way, how would you spend it or use it? I'm getting, uh, I'm getting grief away from this Zoom call from my partner who wants to move into a, a bigger property so uh, that that would uh, be very good timing and would um, would take her pecking of my head away for a time but i don't think i'd change 
much to be quite honest i'm i'm happy with my lot and um i'm enjoying life and i'm i'm because of the uh, challenges in the last year i'm very grateful for for my life and what i have so stanny what advice would you give to a teenage version of yourself well, that's a good question um i would probably say don't bullshit yourself because i um i think i did as a a young player believing that what i wanted to do was to be a professional cricketer um and deep down i i went with it because i thought it gave me some status it gave me a decent income and what have you but i wasn't as committed to being a professional cricketer as I am to being a professional coach. Um, and so so that I probably couldn't have had the career that I've got now without having um, a professional playing career. I, I probably not. But um, but my lessons learned was that was that I drifted, I think, and I wouldn't have drifted. That'd be my advice. Um, and, and so that would come to where you're sort of kidding yourself a little bit. Great. A couple more questions. Uh, which three people have positively impacted on you and your journey to date? And I appreciate that's quite tricky sometimes with three, but which are the yeah. most impactful people? I, I can give two, uh, definitely, which would be, one was a former New Zealand cricketer who, called Bob Blair, who uh, was the professional at my local club uh in 1977 and decided he wanted to take me to australia um he was influential in all sorts of ways at a crucial time when i was making the transition from being an adolescent uh, lad thinking he was a man but, but he he with his direction and sort of influence uh, was a was a uh, a factor in that um, and I'd also then give credit to Bill Bezik as well, uh, not not because he did anything directly, but I learned a lot from him um, about styles, about the, the knowledge, uh, acquiring knowledge about how people learn and acquire skills. Um, so those those two would be my standouts. The third, I don't, I I wouldn't want to stab at a third because i'd be guessing okay no that's that, yeah. and they need to be the ones that come to mind so that's that's yep. really powerful my last question would be you've shared your story there's been loads in it in terms of the ups and downs and the, the challenges but also some of the real proud moments and successes whose sports story might you like to hear and why I, i'm a my sporting well my sporting hero is muhammad ali um uh i think as much not because of his skills as a boxer or his strength of character to stand up against the weight of public opinion when he made a stance about not being drafted um but it was this it was this sort of uncanny self-belief that i i think i admire because I probably wanted, I wanted to have that too. Um, and th this sort of, uh, he transcended the sport um, as an individual, but it, it was within his sport uh, and the, the language that he used to, to other fighters about and what he was doing was just a real gift. And was, so to see him win um, the, the, the title, I think it was a, it may have been for the third time against George Foreman, where he he just again that was probably an instinctive thing because he came out the first round to to uh with all guns blazing and then, then spent six rounds doing the rope a dope thing well, i don't know where that came from because listening to his trainers they'd not really trained hugely for that um and then knocked him out i think it was in the seventh round um but he, he said he was going to do that you know he said he was going to knock him out and and at the time he was he was feared by everybody and all have you. So they were, it was just a time when I was probably very influential as a young person as well. But as I've got older, I've watched quite a bit of footage of red books about him and, and he's somebody that, that, um, you know, admire him, even in the adversity that, that the Parkinson's disease, um, 
gave him towards the end of his life, the way that he conducted himself. Quite admirable. Great. Um, big, big shoes there, aren't they? You know, and they. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I'm not even comparing myself uh, to him at all, but uh, but uh, yeah, what a, what an individual. Yeah, well, and and Stanley, there are some real parallels though in terms of you know the impact that he's had on on his career and he working in a you know in in performance sport environments. But you know, you picked up the the parallel for me was um, his relationship to self belief and his worth and how he put himself out there. You know, and you, you've touched on that throughout your story and your journey. And again, just as we come to an end here you know you've not mentioned too much about the, the current role that you're playing within the England women's side of the game you know can you just say a little bit about what you're doing there and and should anybody wish to find out a little bit more or make contact with you you know can they get you on any of the social media platforms or, or how might they be able to contact you I don't do social media um, okay. um, so I, I'm not quite sure what to say on, on, in that regard um, it's not that I, I I'm against it in any way. I think it's got real value. I just I just don't. I think I would probably say something that I would regret, and if it's there permanently, I I may be embarrassed. Um, so I, I avoid things like that. Um, but anyway, uh, um, I I took up this role with with England um, the England women. It was uh, three years ago, nearly now. I had. I'd put three girls on Lancashire's Academy in my time there, but my awareness of, of the game, I realised, was I was slightly ignorant. And I was also, I was very ignorant about working with a different gender. Um, embarrassingly so. I just thought, well, they're cricketers and I can just work with them. And, and I naively started to coach girls like I'd been coaching lads previously. Um, and when this one young woman looked at me like I had two heads, I realised that uh, I'd, I'd need to, to to adapt what I was doing. It wouldn't it wouldn't just quite work. But that um, it's been the most rewarding time. Um, I think because I've had to properly uh, assess what I do and how I do go about what what I do. Um, and that the, there are so many. With the girls' game in particular, there's so many things that you could do. It's like low-hanging fruit. Which which one, which am I going to pick here? Because everything that you pick could be a success. And it's it's knowing which bits to concentrate on. Um, and I, 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 it's challenged me in ways that I didn't think I'd be challenged, but uh, but really rewarding. That the the impetus that was was there for the women's game um, um, just after the World Cup in Australia was huge. Um, how we come back, like a lot of other sports from the, the pandemic, will be interesting. And, um, but working with them as people has been a privilege and, um, and it's something I want to continue with. You've just opened it up for me and it would be amiss of me not to ask you, but what, what is the difference that you've found and what, what has it really challenged in you to, um, you know, to be uh, the most impactful and the best coach you can be and really bring your philosophy to life? How, how have you had to adapt? The, the, it's quite easy, really, for me. In the, 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 in the in the boys' men's game, there are so many opportunities, playing opportunities, of which you you then find out about yourself um, because you're being challenged on a more on a regular basis. Especially as as you start to get better at the game, the the opportunities of playing uh, representatively are, are, are strong. Whereas in the women's game, when I started, that they the the gap between you know playing counter cricket and then being involved in an England squad that that elevation was so sharp and there was nothing in between it was you know so the, so that it was it was genuinely like throwing people in and like a sink or swim um, and I I could I could see a lot of the reactions to those I had as a player because it was it was too big a step up and. You know, and however skillful you are, you cannot, you cannot hurry that process along. So, um, so, so influencing the, the shaping of the girls' game, um, so that we start to get the right sort of girls involved, who've had an opportunity to, to develop and and challenge their their game against the best. So playing with and against the best, so that when they do come into an England environment, it's not a shock. In the way that it was when I first started, because as I said, I, I started off thinking, well, you know, I just made so many assumptions that they 
that, that would be ready to in an England program. They'd be ready to, and I'd, I could see a weakness in a, a number of the girls about their ability to deal with challenge. But but I learned very quickly that it was because they just they were just new to it, um, and so it shaped how I've gone about things. I'm I'm now a uh, I operate at a, in a significantly different way and manner to how I operated in the men's game. I'd like to maybe challenge you there to say let's let's come back another time and open this one up and talk because it it's a, a podcast in itself that the uh, the the different environments and you know just very quickly there you've shown me the insight and how it's your philosophy about actually helping people become the best versions of themselves and keep progressing but also how it's really challenged you to adapt your style um, and you know, I'm coming back to the very simple words about how you make people feel in the environment. So you, you, you're challenging them, but actually really making them feel that they matter and that they're important and that they can actually progress through it. And, you know, that's been a, a, a real solid feeling I've got from the conversation we've had today. You know, we've come down, you've really bared a lot of your inner thinking, which I just want to thank you for. You know, you've shown that vulnerability. I know you've been through a really tricky patch over the last couple of years both in terms of your professional career, but also your health wise, you know, and your self belief is beginning to really ooze out. And there's a real settlement for me around actually making the most of what you've got ahead of you. So, you know, thanks ever so much for coming on and sharing this with me today, because the one thing I really feel is the stories that we have in sport and the journeys that people have gone through can really motivate, inspire and help other people guide themselves through really difficult times but also really enjoy life and make the most out of it because there are some fantastic stories you've shared in terms of your trips abroad and the time you've had in Australia and how they've really impacted on you. So it leaves me with just saying a, a massive thanks a lot. Keep in touch. Let's hopefully come back next year and see where you've got with the women's game. But on that note, really appreciate it and all the very best. Thanks, David. So there you have it. What a journey John has had. Starting off his love of cricket as a young wicketkeeper through to talent spotting one of England's all-time greats, Jimmy Anderson, and giving Freddie Flintoff his nickname. For me, John has also highlighted the importance of psychology in human performance through his personal experiences and those of helping others. This leads me to pose the following questions for you to consider. Where and how does your self-doubt get in your way? And what are your sport or life measures of success? It would be great to hear your reflections on these questions if you would be happy to share. I can be contacted at the usual address, sportstories247 at gmail.com. As usual, we have another great guest with us next week to offer inspiration, education and motivation to you. So please don't forget to listen in. I have two last requests. If you have valued and enjoyed the podcast, please share and leave a review. This helps others find us and also gives me insight as to what you as the listener like, want and enjoy. And secondly, from me, Dave Levine, have a great week, look after yourself and take some time to consider the questions I've posed. You deserve it. And I look forward to having you with me again very soon for the Sports Stories podcast.